In this video, I want to dive straight into an example with Coulomb's Law. Coulomb's Law is one of the simplest electromagnetics principles, and it was an experiment that uh, ultimately was a, a key component in the development of Maxwell's equations. Coulomb's Law applies when you have two electric charges that are stationary, or if they're moving really slowly. So if you have two charges here, Q1 and Q2, and they're separated by a certain distance R1, 2, you can calculate the force on one of the charges with the following formula. So F21 is the force on charge 2 due to 1. And basically, you, you take the product of the two charges in Coulombs and divide it by this whole expression here. And epsilon 0 is the permittivity of free space. We'll talk more about that, but for now, I just want us to uh, work with this basic formula and get used to how the mathematics works. In this course, I'm assuming that some of you are going to need a review of vector calculus and dealing with the mathematics. And I think that just diving into an example is one of the best ways to uh, really get a refresher on those sorts of things. So here we go. Okay, so here's our example. We've got a y-x coordinate system here, and we have three different point charges. We have q1, q2, and q3. And the problem is asking us to find the total force on charge q2, given these values for the point charges. So the first thing we want to do is calculate the distance between uh, each of the point charges so that we can figure out what is the force exerted on Q2 due to Q3 and what is the force on Q2 due to Q1. So we can go ahead and calculate that using geometry. So R12 here, um, you can see here we can just use the Paragathian theorem. We've got a distance of five meters here and a distance of one meter right here. So you just take the square root of the sum of the squares and you do a very similar thing to find out what R23 is. The next step is to then use these distances that we calculated to compute the individual forces due to Q3 and Q1. And that simply is basically just plug and chug with Coulomb's law. So I basically just plug in those values that we were given and I get a value of 6.91 millinewtons for F21. And in a similar way, we can calculate F23, plug and chug, I get minus 13.5 millinewtons. Now that we have the vector magnitudes, what we now need to do is compute the X and Y components of the individual forces so we can add them all together. Let's first consider the direction of each individual force. We calculated here F21, and I went ahead and sketched out the direction of F21. The reason I know it's in this direction is because by Coulomb's law, uh, the force between Q1 and Q2 has to be on the line joining the two charges. But also, I know that these two charges are both positive. And because they're both positive, that means that they repel one another. And so the force on Q2 is going to be upward in this direction, in line with this line. In a similar way, F23 is going to be on the line between Q3 and Q2, only the force is going to be downward in this direction. And that's because Q3 is negative, Q2 is positive. And so there's a force of attraction. When you have um, plus and minus, it's always attractive. So the force is in this direction. Another thing that I have also done is I've labeled the angles here. 
uh, theta 2 3 I'm calling this angle and then theta 2 1 here and if I can compute these angles I can then compute the x and y components of the individual forces so I can go ahead and compute theta 2 1 using trigonometry here so so theta 2 1 here uh, by geometry it's the same angle over here and you can see now we have this right triangle this distance here is five meters this distance here is one meter so if I take the inverse tangent of five divided by one there I can then calculate my angle theta 2 1 and in a very similar manner, I can also calculate theta 2, 3 with this triangle over here. This distance here is 2 meters. This distance here is 4 meters. I take the inverse tangent of that, that ratio there, and I can calculate the angle. All right, so then we can use geometry to calculate the x and y components of the force. So let's say we want to find the x component of F21. Well, that would just be minus F21 times the cosine of this angle here. It's minus because we know that based on how this is angled, that uh, this, the direction of this force is going to be in this um, direction, in a negative x direction. So I get negative 1.36 millinewtons. In a similar manner, you can also do the same thing for F21y, except now you've got sine of theta 2, um, and it's going to be positive because we know it's, it's oriented up there. And then we have F23x and F23y, very similar. Here we've got F23 times the cosine of theta 2, 3, and we know it's going to be negative, right, because again, it's pointing in this negative x direction. And F23Y is also going to be negative because you can see it's pointed down, unlike this one. So here it was positive, but here we make it negative. Oh, and real quick, one thing I want to mention is this value for F23, 13.5 millinewtons. Um, we calculated in the previous slide that it was negative 13.5. Well, in this equation, when I plug it in here, I just plug it in as positive. And the reason I did that is because the fact that it's negative just tells you that it's the force is attractive. But we already took into account the fact that the force was attractive by drawing our arrow in this direction here. And so we take that into account already with the negative sign here. So you plug that in and you get that value there. Okay, so then computing the total force is relatively straightforward. Basically, if you want to find the x component of the total force on charge Q2, you just add the x components due to the individual charges. And I calculated my, minus 13.41 millinewtons. And you can do the same thing for F2y. You add the individual components, just plug and chug from the numbers on the previous slide. So I get those two values, and then if you want to find the total magnitude of the force, you just again take the square root of the sum of the squares, plug and chug, and I get 13.44 millinewtons. Now before we end this problem, it's always good to make sure that your answer like makes sense, and if I were to sketch out the this force here as an arrow, it would look something like this, because here you can see the the x component is negative 13.41 millinewtons. So it's got a strong component in the negative x direction this way. And then it's got a slightly positive, just 0.75 millinewtons up, going up there. And so it's going to be oriented in, in that direction. But does that make sense? I think it does, because remember, Q3 is negative, Q2 is positive, and Q1 is positive. So the forces between these charged particles, they're, they're repelling one another. They're pushing up against each other. Whereas uh, Q2 is actually attracted to Q3. So you have these, uh, these counteracting forces in the y direction. 
So they tend to cancel each other out. And so it makes sense that your, the y component of your force would be relatively small. On the other hand, in the x direction, keep in mind you know, that these forces, these charges, they're repelling each other, right? So it wants to push the charge this way. But also, Q3 is exerting an attractive force on Q2. So it wants to pull Q2 there. So it makes sense that because there's a repulsion and attraction, that the y, or I'm sorry, the x component would be um, quite, quite large. So our answer does make sense. So this approach to solving the problem was all fine and good. It worked. But if you were to try and solve a more complicated problem, it would get tricky with all of the sines and cosines and trigonometry. So luckily, there's actually a better way to solve these sorts of problems. And I'll be introducing that in my next video. Thank <laughs> you.